Hello, and welcome to Screen Junkies News. You know, there's a lot of movies out right now, Dan, and we so are going to... So many movies, big movies, small movies, medium-sized movies even, which is refreshing. And we're going to talk about just a few of them that you might be interested in that are available in theaters right now, starting with... One that I did not see, but Mr. Dan Merle did, Adrift. Adrift opened last weekend. It was number three at the box office, uh, but it's still in wide release. Just didn't get a chance to review it last week. But it stars uh, Shailene Woodley and Sam Claflin as a couple who are sailing to, uh, trying to sail to the United States across the Pacific and get caught up in a storm. And the two of them now have to literally navigate their way to survival uh, over many, many weeks uh, on just open water. This is set in the 80s, so I know a lot of people are like, oh, well, why wouldn't they have this? That these things didn't exist. So it, it, is, it is really a tale of survival. It is a true story. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a movie that I, I liked parts of. Some other parts didn't quite ring true for me. Um, I, you know, I generally thought it was, it was, it was, it was all right. It was, it was fine. Um, Shailene Woodley's performance is very strong in some spots. There are some other spots where I thought it might be a little weaker. And then Sam Claflin has kind of a lot of complicated stuff to do. He's, you know, it's, it's sort of a conventional romance for part of it. And then uh, afterwards, he's sort of banged up and injured. And so he's immobilized, literally, for a lot of the movie. And there's also some stuff with how they tell the movie. The movie's structured very strangely in that it's not straightforward. You see... Well, you know, the aftermath of what happened and then you flash back to huh. see them meeting and then you see more of the aftermath and then you flash back to see them meeting. And so the movie kind of goes back and forth through the whole thing until you finally kind of coalesce at a certain point. And is it the point of a tidal wave? Uh, it, it may be. It may very <laughs> well be. But, you know, for for a while, um, you kind of wonder why they're doing that. And then it becomes very clear why. Uh it, Even though it had a function, telling it that way did have a function with how they told the story. I did think it was a bit uneven in the sense of like there there comes a point where it's a bit of an anticlimax in the sense of like you've seen them now trying to survive for so long and you know what's coming for so long leading up to it that you're kind of flashing. You're just kind of like, OK, let's you know, I know where this is headed. However, having said that, um, there's a reason why they do that. And I think that for a lot of people, it, it will hold a lot of weight. And the movie kind of hinges on whether you go with that or not. Uh, I did a little bit. I will say that if you know, if you don't know the real story, I would not research it because I think that a lot of the movie's weight and power lies in the audience not knowing the details of this story. So, um, recommend it. I, in the I wouldn't. I wouldn't not recommend it. Okay. Is what I'll say. I, I'm not going to tell you not to go see it. I didn't love it. Um, however, I thought that there were some very strong moments, um, particularly in the direct aftermath. I thought Shailene Woodley did some very strong work, um, and I think that if it, you know, it's it's a it's a couple in peril movie. If that's the kind of thing that you enjoy, I'm not going to say don't go see it. But it wasn't. You know, it's not a must see for me. Everest. This director also directed Everest as well. Yes. He did, yes. And that was a movie that's another sort of like survival in peril movie. And um, I enjoyed aspects of that film, but that was one that I felt like I was just fine to see at home. Would you kind of put that in that? Yeah. I mean, I, I, this, I think this would be definitely not a wasted night if you want to wait, uh, if you don't want to take the trouble to go out and spend the money or find a babysitter or whatever. I think this would be. A, a, a great film to Redbox or Netflix or whatever when it comes out, watch at home. Um, totally fine. Very different movie, American Animals, directed mm -hmm. by um, Bart Layton, starring Evan Peters, Blake Jenner, and Dowd, who, by the way, is the MVP support player this year, I think. She's doing some great work. Doing some great work. Um, and Barry Kogan. Yeah. Um, this movie, I think, is one people have been asking, should they, should they see it in the theater? Should they see it at home? It's a little bit tricky. If you're going to see one movie in this weekend in the theater, we're going to tell you what it is at mm -hmm. the end of this show. However, if you're a film fan, this is a movie that is very interestingly and for the most part, very um, successfully playing with form. Yeah. It is a hybrid narrative documentary about an attempted heist that some young men make. And it is very interestingly told in terms of the characterization. For me, the climax of the film was 
well, a little bit anticlimactic, and that's inherent because the case doesn't go the way that a normal narrative heist film would. Mm -hmm. It doesn't kind of carry the same amount of stakes that a normal film like that would. Having said that, I think it's really worth seeing if you're just interested in film and how people can and do sometimes play with form um, because he does it really well. What did you? And these are great performances as well. Uh, really great performances. I would actually recommend that people go see it in the theater just because this movie does take... I wasn't quite as underwhelmed by the, by the climax or the end of the film as... Um, I think you might have been. And I think that the film does take some turns that I, that seeing it with an audience uh, might enhance the experience just because I, I love seeing movies that sort of twist and turn a little bit. And this is also a very, hu there's a lot of mm. moments of levity, levity and humor, both dark humor and just, you know, th these are interesting characters. As you mentioned, it is a hybrid. So you see the real people. They're kind of intermingled with the characters. They interact. You you hear their version. And, and it's also kind of, I love that they play with the concept of memory. Yeah. One person remembers it this way, one person remembers it that way. Was I right? Was he right? Does it matter? I think that this has a lot to say about that. And uh, I, this is uh, really kind of took me by surprise because it is kind of being sold as as a as a, just a kind of typical heist movie. And I think it has a lot more dimension than that. Um, and it's also a film that is slowly rolling out. So uh, I think most people won't be able to see it for another week or mm -hmm. two. Uh, that gives it enough time, hopefully, to roll out. Um, I, I would actually recommend uh, seeing this if it's near you when you can, because um, just with the with the way that it plays with form mm -hmm. and even editing, different stuff like that, uh, I think that it's uh, that's enough for me to recommend it. Um, one one of one of my uh, favorite movies of the year so far. You know, maybe not top five, but definitely up there. I really enjoyed this movie. I really enjoyed this one as well. And to your echoing one of the th ideas about memory, it's also kind of, and, and this is the cool thing because the story informs the form mm -hmm. um, because it's about adults who made a very dumb move when they were young based on things that all young people experience, boredom, the desire to understand yourself, the desire to actualize in life, mm -hmm. and then reflecting back on it. And you know what? Our memories are flawed. Yeah. Um, and our perceptions of ourselves shift over time. And so the movie is able to play with those two things really, really well. And it smartly. plays with the concept of the unreliable narrator. Yeah. And as it goes along, it, it sort of, uh, you know, again, in playing with the form of the movie, there are certain events that it presents as fact that as maybe you go, they're not. maybe they're not, but it's not out to prove it one way yeah. or the other. It's it's a really kind of hard to categorize film, and I think it does some very interesting things. I agree, and I think that you should see it as a person interested in film, and and it plays with the idea that a story itself mm -hmm. should we question everything exactly. Um, Another film, interestingly enough, that's actually playing with both of, both of those things is The Tale, um, yep. which is currently on HBO. Um, it is a film that came out of Sundance and, by Jennifer Fox, who's a documentarian. And she had an experience while she was making a documentary um, about female sexuality in which she started to recall an experience of abuse that she had had as a child. But the way that she had framed this experience for herself um, in her adult life was that she had a, quote, relationship when mm -hmm. she was 13 years old with an older man um, and woman. And um, what happens throughout the film is it's really fascinating because it's not unlike American animals you don't see um, the woman that this really happened to however Laura Dern who stars in the movie um, is playing Jennifer Fox and she uses that name mm -hmm. and so you feel the presence of the real Jennifer Fox because she's directing it um, and it's her story and so when Laura Dern remembers herself she sees herself in a particular way mm -hmm. at that age and then she sees a picture and realizes how tiny and young she was yeah. And then it starts to open the store of unpacking and unraveling what really did happen to her and the impact that that's had on her entire life subconsciously, even even though she didn't understand that it was having this impact. It's a really fascinating, very difficult to watch movie. Mm -hmm. um, it is. I don't want that to dissuade you from checking it out, however, um, because I think it opens the door to all kinds of conversations. I think it opens the door to an investigation among yourselves about how you remember your life and how your life may have impacted you in ways that you may not be fully consciously aware of. Yeah. Really beautiful, very brave performances from Laura Dern, Elizabeth Debicki, Jason Ritter, um, among others in this movie, and very, very 
kind of powerful work from Jennifer Fox, the filmmaker. This came out of Sundance. HBO bought it. Um, they are currently running this film, and it's it's one of those things that certainly I hope is in the conversation for uh, Emmy consideration. And you should definitely definitely check. And the and, and the chill the child actors in this movie, unbelievable, mm. very upsetting. Like I said but um, very brave, uh, thought-provoking performances that, again, question the way we look at our own lives um, yeah. and how that can, certain things can trigger a dramatic change. The tale is a story that she wrote, Jennifer Fox wrote, when she was a young teenager. Her mother found it while she was making this documentary and sent it to her, and she started, started her on this path of self-discovery. Mm. Um, a different movie on the other end of the spectrum uh, yeah. <laughs> that also in a way in a way plays with with how we uh, perceive things in life is upgrade from Lee Winnell. Yes, uh, which is first of all I want to say that if you have not seen the trailers for Upgrade and particularly if you have not seen the Red Band trailer for Upgrade, don't watch don't. it. Don't. Because it gives away a lot of the great moments in this movie. Um, and I was worried as it kind of unfolded that sort of the, I'd seen the best parts of it, but it actually, you haven't. And this movie takes things in a very uh, unexpected direction from what I thought was gonna happen. Lee, Win Lee Winnell, who most people know from his work in horror movies yes. as an actor in the Insidious franchise, as a writer on a lot of franchises, including Saw. many Saw movies. And a lot of people kind of, I think, assumed this was a horror movie. I know you said I did. So I managed to stay away from the marketing, which again, I'm really glad I did. Mm -hmm. However, it took me about 50, I went with a few friends last weekend and it took me about 15 minutes to go, oh, this is not this a, is horror a horror movie, movie. Yeah. at all. <laughs> yeah. This is a sci-fi action uh, thriller. Thriller, yeah. yeah, techno thriller. Yeah. And uh, it's about a guy who is paralyzed and gets an implant in his neck that allows him to move, but the implant itself is also aware, mm -hmm. and they are able to converse and talk to each other, and as he tries to unravel what happened to him, many, many other consequences uh, unfold that perhaps he did not consider. Yes. And we, we kind of go from there. And it's a movie that I love when I'm watching a movie and I get to a point in the movie and I go like, okay, I see where they're going. And we get to that point and, and I think that that's happened. And I'm like, okay, I call it. But then it takes another turn or two turns and I'm like, oh, wow. Like, that's, you got me. And mm -hmm. I was even looking for maybe where it was going and you still got me. That's what happened with this movie. Uh, and I think Logan Marshall Green is the lead. And... I, one of the things that I kind of thought about is when you're watching a movie, you sort if, if it's a good movie, you accept the reality of that movie. So you are watching this character who's kind of partially controlled by an, uh, technology. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to his you know, ver verbal performance, which is great, uh, I, his physical performance in this movie oh, is yeah. so impressive in the sense of like, depending on his posture, his stance, his motion, you can tell who's in control. Is, is he in control? Is the AI in control? Is it a combination of both? And the way that Lee Winnell, who directed this movie, shot the action, I thought, was also very innovative. It could have been sort of John Wickish style choreography throughout, but he's able to kind of put you in the brain mm -hmm. of uh, the lead character and he shoots it in a very innovative way so you're kind of always following him and the frame sort of moves around him yeah uh, and i thought that was done in a really um fun way where it could have just been very conventional and then also it shows you what you can do with a well weaponized budget yeah uh, the movie's what like a five million dollar budget i think and it looks great the special effects are good and it just goes to show you when you have when you're able to effectively use the different kinds of money, you can have a great product. Because he's not relying, he's relying quite a bit on, um, again, on performance. He's relying on the camera. He's relying a little bit on the production design mm -hmm. um, in terms of there's a character who is a, a young tech, techno genius character and you, you need a little bit of flash around him yeah. um, to sell who that character is. I think the thing that I, Logan Marshall Green, I wondered how he had trained for this mm -hmm. um, because not only does he have to at a certain point play himself but a, and a paralyzed person, but he has to move his body as if he is out of control and, and yeah. almost fight with himself um, and then have a moment of agreement um, to give over control to this device. It's a really fascinating um, thing to behold in this. It's really centered on this one performance. 
there's some very basic tropes in here, right? Yeah. Um, he is motivated by love and revenge, uh, core human elements. And so to your point, I think Lee Winnells is almost tricking you mm -hmm. um, because he's setting up a thing that we've seen many times in many movies. Uh, you killed my ex, I'm mm -hmm. gonna come get you, yeah. right? Or you're threatening my whatever loved one, I'm gonna come get you. Uh, that, that takes a turn yeah. at a certain point in a really delightful way um, that that is bold. Mm -hmm. This movie ends in a way that I really enjoyed and it opens up the door to a question that I won't reveal here because you'll see what the question is. They actually say it. Yeah. Um, that I think is really relevant to how we use technology um, and how we feel about our own lives. I know that's sounding very lofty. It's a really fun action movie too. There are some fight scenes in this that are so delightful to behold. Yeah. So absolutely thrilling. And it's one of those wish fulfillment things where you wish that suddenly you could be a superhero. Um, and this guy gets that ability through this AI. There are consequences to that. Check it out. Do not watch anything. Just go watch the movie. I think this is a fun movie to see with other people, too. Oh, it's a great audience movie, which is yeah. why I would recommend seeing it in the theater because it's great to hear the oohs and the ahs and the ohs. And the, the, yeah. there are definitely some moments that are designed to elicit a reaction from a theater of people. That's why I think that a lot of movies, you just can't. It's not the same experience at home as seeing it. Uh, certainly the audience that I was with was... On into cue. it was into oh, it yeah, and on cue too. and uh, yeah so that's you gotta respect some well-used violence you, you do because yeah, I mean, it's not gratuitous it really isn't it's not it, it, it's 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 gratuitous when it needs to be in the sense of like it it's it, it, it's not that it's not graphic it's just not relentlessly graphic and he, they pick and choose their moments it's in its second week it should still be in plenty of theaters nationwide yeah. i'm actually i want to watch the box office numbers on this because i think this has good word of mouth and i want to see where it goes in week two to see if it's going to have some staying power because i think it deserves to be seen by maybe more people than have already gone to see it i think so too however i will say this look sometimes you got to make a decision in your weekend for the sake of time mm -hmm. for the sake of money for both of those things i know i do um and if there's one movie that you're going to watch this weekend you have some homework it's fun work yeah the movie is called hereditary and if tony collette does not get an oscar nomination for this movie i riot something is wrong uh something is horribly wrong if the awards uh, voters do not remember this performance mm -hmm. at the end of the year Gabriel um, Byrne, Alex Wolf, um, Millie Shapiro, star Ari Aster directs. We're going to do a deep dive on this mm -hmm. for Saturday. But overall, without spoiling anything, because, boy, this is one that you, you're not going to want to know much about either. Mm -mm. What I love about, we mentioned twice now about the marketing of movies and not to watch it. Um, or that it's misleading or whatever. I love what Hereditary's done with the marketing mm -hmm. of this movie because even the way this movie is marketed is setting your expect, and I think they knew what they were doing, is setting your expectation for one thing, and it's not what this is. And I, I don't, I, I feel it's weird to balance that line. I don't want to overhype it in the sense of like I don't want you to walk in. I think the, I think one of the reasons the witch, because remember the, when the witch came out, yeah. it had an atrocious cinema score mm -hmm. uh, because it was hyped as the next exorcist it was mm -hmm. hyped as the scariest movie you'll ever see in your life and it just wasn't on it's that wavelength yeah. and people were expecting it to be yeah so i don't want to overhype this but i also uh, you know this is one of my my five favorite films that i've seen so far this year i plan on we're going to do a spoiler review for this weekend i'm going to go see it again tonight because i want to see it now through the eyes of having seen it once, I want to see it again and kind of just start taking mental notes about the setups and the, the, the seeds that they lay throughout this movie. Now, I thought about doing that, Dan, but I don't think I can. And the reason why is, and this, this is going to sound like it's not a selling point, but it actually is, about halfway through this movie, I thought, this is incredible. I think I need to leave. It's unbearable um, tense. It is unbearably tense. It is, I will say that as someone that has watched horror my whole life, it builds the elements really beautifully, like or orchestrally built. Mm -hmm. 
um, and, and you think you're, you're really watching a family drama and then it's also with horror elements and then they really escalate. Mm -hmm. But even within that, I think it is legitimately creepy. I think it's <laughs> truly legitimately creepy, but in a way that's about the tension, um, that is about what you don't know, what you're trying to understand, what the characters don't know what they're trying to understand and what they are psychologically being put through, which is a lot, by the way. And it's my favorite kind of horror movie because it scared me without resorting to jump scares. And there are moments in this movie that a lesser movie or a lesser filmmaker or a studio that wasn't A24 mm. that would have been, that felt pressure. That refuses to put out a bad movie. Uh, yeah, or at least one that, that is just bland. Yeah. It's, it's polarizing, maybe. Yeah. Um, there are moments in this movie that, oh, I was watching, I'm like, oh, that's where the jump scare would have been. Mm -hmm. There's maybe but maybe not. one or two jump scares, yeah. and they're not even the cheap kind. It's just there are so, some events that are just cold, that are just startling. I love that this movie scared me without resorting to that. If you, like me, are sensitive to jump scares and are like are hedging on saying, like, I don't know if I want to go see Hereditary. I don't like jump scares. or hard. That's not a reason not to go see it. But, but it, it, if you are unnerved easily. It is, <laughs> it is very, very unnerving. unnerving. And yes. it also it, it brilliantly does the things that the best horror movies do. It relies on your imagination. Mm -hmm. It lets you know that there is a thing to, to be seen, but I'm not showing it to you yeah. because whatever you come up with is going to be worse than that. It's also a mystery. Mm -hmm. um, and it's got, it has this really amazing blend of, of feeling like a very classic horror movie. Like, and I don't want you to go in with an idea in your head by what that means, but yeah. tonally, mm -hmm. like a Rosemary's Baby. It is not a Rosemary's Baby, tonally, um, tonally. Yeah. Um, but also very modern in the sense of it understands the genre and there are actually some very funny moments. There are. Yeah. Tension releasing moments, which a good horror movie also needs to have. It's a first for us because usually spoiler reviews we do for the big, the big releases, movies, the yeah. Star Wars and the Marvels of the world. And we both saw it earlier this week or last last week, mm. I think. And I, I know we both came in with the same idea, which is that this is not going to be a movie that opens to $30 million or probably $20 million. Yeah. But this is going to be a movie that when people see it, the first thing they're going to want to do is go home and, and find other people that have seen and, this movie yeah. and start dissecting it and comparing notes. And so that's what we're going to do. So... We just want to tell people, go see this movie as one of the best movies I, I've certainly that I've seen. And I think if you do, you're going to want to talk about it, which is why we're going to be back on Saturday Come with a spoiler with review. I think Saturday, we haven't yeah. decided exactly, this weekend with a spoiler review, because we want to talk about it with you, compare our notes and share our thoughts and see what you thought, because I think it's going to be one of those movies that you, were, you, you, you want to dissect and go see again. It certainly was for me. Uh, there are some other movies out there that I personally need to catch up on. Mm -hmm. First Reformed is one that's on my list. I might try to see Won't You Be My Neighbor this weekend, Hotel Artemis. So there are a bunch of movies out there that we're hearing good things about as yeah. well, and we'll try to watch those and come back and talk with you guys about those as well. For sure. Um, however, your assignment this weekend, because I need someone to talk about this with. We've been desperately, desperately like, trying to find more. We need, we need more people. It's like the yeah. ring, but it's, it's not going to be a murder ghost. Yeah. We need more people to talk about this movie with and see what they thought because yes. it's been, it's that kind of movie. It's that kind of movie. So come back on Saturday, I believe, yeah. um, and join in the conversation with us on Hereditary after you've seen it. Let us know some of your favorite smaller films. Maybe we missed them um, that we should be keeping a lookout for now. And we will be back with more movie reviews as always, as always. in the weeks to come. Yep. Thanks for watching.